Patrick O'Brien is, without exception, the hardest man to know that I have ever met in my life. Rarely has a public figure controlled what's known about him better than Patrick O'Brien has. His reticence is genuine, but it has also become quite a PR point in itself. Patrick is now famous for being reticent. Connecting a writer's life to his work is the basis of most literary biography. But when a writer's life is as mysterious as Patrick O'Brien's, conventional biography is virtually impossible. O'Brien understands this better than most. He's now a best-selling novelist, but he's also been a biographer. The subject of his own life, however, remains a closed book. Until recently, he declined all requests for interviews. People very rarely keep the right bounds of, of the limits that, that I chose to set. I don't like personal questions, and almost every interviewer has nothing but personal questions to ask. I don't like personal questions. I don't like personal questions. I don't like personal questions. It's the affection and the love that, and the gratitude that people have you know, for these books. Excuse me. Yes, darling. We are reaching the show must go on. All right. Show must go Fellow honored guests, welcome aboard HMS Rose and a dinner in honor of our only begetter, Patrick O'Brien. Then we'll be able to have our feast at last. Good morning, sir. We've caught a fish, as you see. I caught him, sir, cried Davies. I caught him. That's somebody there, you goddamn swabs. But he must weigh about 500 pounds. You shall have his tail and belly, sir. You shall blow out your kite with his tail and belly. <laughs> <laughs> O'Brien's writing is much more interesting than Conrad's. Even Melville. God, forgive me. But uh, it, it's true. This puts C.S. Forrester in the shade. I said, this isn't a race of hornblower stuff. You've just compared Shakespeare to Penthouse Magazine or something. There are people now who seem to be devoting their lives to Patrick O'Brien. I was talking to one of his editors at Norton the other night, and he said, it is amazing. He said, this stuff is like crack for intellectuals. A glass of wine with you, sir? Sure. They seem absolutely intoxicated with this stuff. A glass of wine with everybody, sir. Sirs and madam. These people have gathered to celebrate the absent creator of a world in which they've immersed themselves. The creator of this world is Patrick O'Brien, author of a series of 19 novels set in the British Navy during the Napoleonic Wars. To O'Brien's devoted readers, these books are much more than sea stories. In the best possible way, O'Brien's novels are escape novels. They are the kind of historical novel which allows you to escape into a primeval world which in some odd way is better and more alive than you feel your contemporary mundane reality to be. For half a century, Collioure, in the Catalan corner of southern France, has been refuge and writing place for Patrick O'Brien. For most of that time, O'Brien struggled for recognition as a novelist. But in the last decade, worldwide success has come with what he calls his naval tales. Nineteen novels featuring the same two central characters. O'Brien has said that a man rarely coincides with his books. Whether or not this is true in his case, few have been able to judge so well as he kept the world at bay. When I discovered Patrick's novels and realized that this was a very great writer who had received no publicity at all, none, none whatsoever, not a word, 
I decided that I would like to write an article about him, and I wrote to Patrick requesting an interview. And he replied in this most decorous letter, saying that he had long wondered what he would do if someone was so gracious as to write to him, asking him about uh, the possibility of an interview. And he had long before decided that should this eventuality ever arise, he would politely decline because he detested publicity of any kind. The Magnolia grandiflorens, they flower magnificently in Perpignan. They take some time to settle, but we wanted one right away to pre prevent ourselves from being seen from that odious balcony now. But that's that, that, it, its prime function, because how, how, down... Did the, how did the Magnolia uh, tree arrive? Well, look, you must let me finish. And I didn't want to ask that fellow's permission to lift it from his land over this hedge, as you see. You see, it's a very considerable hedge. So we flew it in with a helicopter. The very fine sight it was. The man let it down absolutely exactly into the hole the gardener had made. And I hope that the tree will thrive if I water it strongly enough. How easy a man is Patrick to get to know? That is, I think, what Patrick would call come, comes deuced close to a personal question. <laughs> and, um, no, I can't answer that, I'm afraid. Uh, it is showing new growth, you know. He does not come from a culture where letting it all hang out is the uh, normal way of proceeding. He comes from a culture where good manners and courtliness and um, a sense of privacy all run together. and. That is part of his vision of a civilized society, I think. Patrick has immersed himself in the 18th century for so long, and I suspect inside his head lived as much in the 18th century as he has in our own, that uh, he is in many respects writing what feel like 18th century novels in the 20th century. I think one of the possible explanations for the skill with which he explores the 18th century, in the early 19th, is that he lived there. Uh, he may, in fact, be some kind of a, a visitor from that time because of how well he understands it, how completely. But again, I wouldn't dream of discussing that with him. I live very much away from the active world. I do know quite a lot about the past. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of what's ordinarily called research, and I'm perhaps more at home in those realms than I am with the present world of a rather curious civilization. One of this century's longest series of novels began in 1969 when O'Brien published the first in his sequence of naval tales. The saga is propelled above all by the relationship between two characters at the heart of all the books. Heroic English sea captain Jack Aubrey and enigmatic half-Irish ship surgeon and spy Dr. Stephen Maturin. Jack Aubrey must have spent more time afloat than ashore. He had fought in more great fleet battles and in more single ship actions than most officers of his time. He had boarded many and many an enemy, and it was at these times that he felt most wholly alive. In this, he was quite unlike his friend Stephen Maturin, who took no pleasure in any battle whatsoever. When he was obliged to fight, he did so with a cold efficiency. The relationship between Stephen Maturin and Jack Aubrey is now, we see, with, what, the 19th novel coming out, is the key to the whole thing. It's the product of a real writer striking his form, and he brings to his writing 
everything that he has. Despite O'Brien's reluctance to relate himself to his books, those who know him detect in Jack Aubrey and Stephen Matron shades of their creator. There's an element of self-dramatization on Patrick's part, of divergent tendencies in himself. I've always felt that Patrick temperamentally and intellectually and in his, his manner of thinking is close to Stephen. He once told me that Jack was inspired by someone he had known in the army. Jack Aubrey is the, almost the epitome of the superb commander, the military man, who all the way back to Achilles and up through Desert Storm have distinguished themselves and uh, saved civilization, if you will. I wondered if you ever knew anyone like Jack Aubrey. Yes, I, uh, I, far the smallest in my family. I, I had a brother, Michael. He was like my father, about six foot, between six foot two and four. Very big man indeed. Very good rider when he could get a horse to carry him. Very good shot. I, I fairly worshipped him when I was a boy. He, he knew, he knew such, such, such a lot about birds and beasts. And he was very kind to me when I was a little chap. And I think I may have transposed some of my affection for my who was killed in the war into, into my affection for Jack Aubrey. Brother Michael, 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 who was killed in the war, killed in the war, killed in the war, killed in the war, killed in the war. If I just type in O'Brien, we should have his details. There are five casualties listed with the surname O'Brien in our Second World War index. And it appears we don't have an M O'Brien. O'Brien's brother, then, clearly didn't share his surname. How many really good novelists does one know who are transparent people? Most of them are people who dislike personal self-revelation except through their novels. And I would say that was true of O'Brien, too, that if you want to know about O'Brien, uh, you've got to read about Maturin. Stephen Maturin was naturally a reserved and even a secretive man. The power of keeping his mouth shut was innate. So perhaps was the integrity that made him one of the Admiralty's most valued secret agents. Stephen Maturin is one of the most complex people in literature. He's an Irish patriot. He's half Catalan. He's a physician. He's a secret agent in the, the war against Napoleon. He writes a diary in code in which he disgorges the secrets of his soul. Maturin, uh, Patrick, I think, knows from inside because a lot of Maturin is himself. After you've met Patrick, you soon find that the word order in Maturin's sentences, the intonations, the the, the touch of Irish brogue that occasionally comes in is exactly Patrick. And this is a dark and complicated man. He has the desperate passions as I had in my youth, very tearing and painful ones. And then, of course, is an intelligent agent, uh, as I have been. So, so I'm just in those senses, but there, there's, there's no self-identification self there. I don't talk through his mouth. We don't know what Patrick was doing during the Second World War, but he does seem to understand the appalling pressures and the private terrors of what it is to be an agent in the field. An agent in the field who, if uh, caught, will die he understands that with the, the full range of emotion and intuitive skill which suggests that he has been there. Has he been there? I don't know. 
Dr. Maturin was the Admiralty's most esteemed advisor. Black Coat and his colleagues knew that in his character as a physician, a learned man perfectly at home in both Catalan and Spanish, he could move about the country as freely as any native, an incomparable agent, sure, discreet, deeply covered. A man of their own kind. I suspect that Patrick was deployed in the part of France where he now lives because of his languages, having French and Spanish and Catalan. Um, it would be silly not to use someone in that way. During the Second World War, there were a significantly large number of British secret organizations working in southwest France. So therefore, to try and find out who was working in that area and for each of these different organizations, as it's a heck of a task, not merely because of the volume of the files, but also because of the fact that some of those files are incomplete, some of them haven't been released by the government yet. And then, of course, the other problem is the nature of the business means people use different names all the time. So, is the name that you're looking for the real one? You, you, you mustn't fish for anything particular, because I just won't produce it. There's a great oath in Ephesians, if you chance on it, in Dale's 29 distinct damnations, one sure if another fails. And that's the sort of oath one took. One says nothing. You can so easily trip, blunder, and compromise something that must not be compromised. When I was writing books about the Second World War, I met and interviewed quite a lot of people who'd worked in intelligence. And there is a common denominator about those people, that they do tend to be rather strange people. And if there is a common denominator, it is they're all people who get a terrific buzz out of knowing things that other people don't. O'Brien likes the veil. He likes um, secrecy. He likes not to be open. Even those who thought about him a lot are really not that much wiser than where we were when we started. Well, this is a narwhal tusk, the narwhal being a northern, smallish northern whale, of which the male has uh, just two canine teeth, only one of which develops, and it goes on and on and on developing in this extraordinary shape, spirals with, with tori. And I've been to ask really eminent uh, physiologists whether the spirals and those waves add to the strength. It doesn't appear to pierce ice at any time. It doesn't seem to fight other novels with it. And the Eskimos who hunt it, uh, they've never complained of its harshness to them. It seems perfectly mild and harmless. But there it is. It, it's a very, very curious object. And I find it in itself, it has a, a surreal beauty. I mean to polish it a good deal more. The time of these novels is the time of the great British and indeed European naturalists, people who made endless collections of strange creatures, people who dissected things and put them in jars and bottles and looked at their muscles and understood their ovaries. And people who at the same time, like Stephen Maturin, would fill a whole cabin of a ship with a family of opossums. That again is, is, is a reflection of, of my older brother, Michael, who was quite passionate about such things. He went to Australia at one time and he used to send me back opossum skins and the skins of a carpet snake which was 16 feet long. And uh, he, was, he was cutting, cutting some very tall crop and the pe creature peered from uh, over the top of it and he took its head off with his machete. Skinned animals and so sent it back and I had it taped round my bedroom. How powerful is Patrick O'Brien's imagination? Very powerful. Uh, 
I can't remember when I did not have an interest in birds. Both of those, there's a peregrine, and just behind the peregrine, there's uh, what's rather appropriately called a short-toed eagle, but well, uh, seems to me to have reasonable toes. And uh, there are a pair of them that live quite close to us. And in the evening, they drift across the ridge, gazing downwards, until they see a serpent, an unsuspecting serpent. Down they go, seize the serpent, and swallow him in mid-air. And you see the tail wriggle with indignation until it vanishes. There's a kind of splendor about the birds of prey. And there's the certain knowledge that if you vex them and you're in reach, you'll cough it most horribly. Cough it most horribly. Cough it most horribly. Furthermore, said Stephen, I have every reason to believe that the eagle owl is present. Not only have I seen his rejections, but Abbas Effendi imitated his voice unmistakably. A deep, strong, ooh-hoo, ooh-hoo, calculated to strike terror into mammals as large as a gazelle and birds the size of a bustard. Stephen and Patrick are both small, bird-like men. They both have reptilian glares. When he turns on you in anger, as he has turned on me in anger because I have intruded on his privacy, he has a hard reptilian glare, which uh, Patrick says that Stephen has. There's a coldness and a, a quiet bloodthirstiness about Stephen, which works rather well as an intelligence agent, but uh, at another level is, is at, at some points appalling. Maturin uh, uses the surgical techniques uh, that are dictated by the fact that anesthesia was not available. The best you could do was uh, get your patients drunk and stoned on laudanum, but they still were quite sensible to pain. So the idea of the surgeon was to get in and get out as quickly as possible. I've read a good deal of uh, physiology and the like. A lot of my friends were medicos some relatives too. I was also a very, very sickly child and youth, and with the medicine, so you absorb the theory of medicine to some degree. As soon as the sun is up, I must have off the top of his skull with my little saw. You'll see the gunner's brain, my dear sir, Maturin added with a smile. The, the saw is good. It has a good offset. Gives you quite a channel. And I think you'd approve of that. He would have despised these edges. I mean, you, 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 you just have to be able to shave your, the hairs off your forearm or hand. But the, the, the balance of that I, I find very agreeable. It's true, I can't. I can't claim to have amputated many of my fellow men's limbs, but if I had to do it, I think that's rather the life I should choose. Though there's that crescent-shaped one that would really get a fine grip on sinews. I think it's required great strength of mind and strength of character to um, live the determined life which he has to devote himself to the creation of this world. And there are no doubt aspects of the modern world which he finds surprising, distasteful, or simply a waste of time. Not it is such a business making a documentary. He has a kind of passionate collector's desire to know everything much much more than he can ever tell you about what kind of wood anything was made of or exactly what kind of knives and forks people ate with 
It's not, this is useful to me for telling my story with. It's just pure curiosity. I want to know exactly how it was, and then I will set a story there. And I think that comes over. You can't fake that. Well, I should very much like to see Bologna 74, and then I'd like to see frigates of the 28, 32, and 36 gun. Many of the sick from the inshore vessels were now aboard the Bologna, and very soon, Dr. Maturin was making his morning rounds up on deck. Oh, yes. It's reminiscent of a Renaissance ship. Yes. And now, you, you, you had an open promenade, if you wished. The author really loves his characters, really identifies with them, really works from inside them. Nevertheless, he also observes them like kind of struggling insects and says, look, it's moved over there now. Are its motions not interesting? Very fine. I, I like her very well indeed. On the inside of them, Draco Aubrey and Stephen Maturin would have played their music. Evenings with the Captain is the first recording we made of music from the O'Brien novels, and it attempts to, to pick up and, and, and offer a, a representative selection of the works and the types of works that we found Mr. O'Brien had referred to so often in the course of the novels. And that was the first movement of the Locatelli Sonata where Aubrey and Maturin have just met at the very beginning of Master and Commander. Although Stephen Maturin and Jack Aubrey were almost as unlike as men could be, they were united in a deep love of music. And many and many an evening had they played together, violin answering cello. I should love above all things, as said Dr. Johnson, to play our cello. And could I play our cello, as he also said, I should do nothing else. One would lose oneself in that. I can play no instrument at all. A thing I do very much regret is that I've had no success with quills. I've applied to friends who live in two rooms where geese are much eaten, four quills. They've always somehow managed to wriggle out of the ob obvious obligation to get me some goose quills. But before, I hope before, my, before I'm 90, I shall start writing a book that'll go right through with one goose quill. <coughs> Itches the All of our books look like this. Each of these little tabs is a, is a food mention. So we went through, marked these, uh, entered them in a database, sorted through them, and um, then decided almost arbitrarily according to which no, were our not favorites. At all. Yes. Well, certain things, the suet puddings we had to have because it was so important to O'Brien. But um, most of the other choices were made because they appealed to us. We thought they were interesting funny weird for instance floating, floating archipelago. archipelago in, in the, the shape, shape of, of the galapagos. galapagos how can you resist what do you make of the americans most fervent attachment to your books i, I don't understand it i i can only imagine that there's a greater multiplicity of americans than i had imagined your scrabbits the stuffing sir says mrs pullings we call them your scrabbits Pullings has a little sow that digs them up in the edge of the new forest. 18th century mini chop. Hmm. We are known We're to in some, some people circles as the rat ladies because of the Miller's and onion sauce which we cooked. Um, Miller's are rats. We call oh. them 
Millers. Millers to make them eat better, says Jack. Um, they mm. are, yeah. we, we're not making any for this particular dinner because we've heard that one or two of our guests are squeamish, but. Um, also, it wasn't served, they weren't served in, in the, the great cabin. cabin. Yeah. Anyway, this is what they looked like when we did make them. As Mr. O'Brien says, neatly skinned, laid out like tiny sheep. First thing everybody asks us, did you do make the Millers in onion, onion sauce? sauce? I claim to be one of the early American discoverers of that great uh, British author. For years, for a long time, I had to buy the books in England. No American publisher believed that another hornblower, as they put it, would go. Uh, but uh, uh, they finally discovered the books. And of course, uh, since then, history's been made in the United States and the colonies. Really. You have no idea. No. Bill, Bill. This lady who prepared our meal tonight and did the cookbook on the basis of our research. Oh, the book. From, yeah, we are known as the amiable sluts. We had to restrain them and ask them not to serve the rats tonight, however. Excuse me, slut. Move it, slut. Young hen pheasants, boned, stuffed wow. tight with truffles. In a jelly of their own life's blood, Madeira and calves foot. Truffles, my dear madam, where do you find these princely truffles? Oh, we call them earth grubbits. Orange, his cook, had been wonderfully generous with his slush, and the liquid fat stood half an inch over the whole surface, while the potatoes and pounded biscuits that ordinarily make up the bulk of this dish could scarcely be detected at all being quite overpowered by the fat meat, fried onions, and powerful spices. <laughs> As the books came into print and they started selling, what was interesting was no one knew anything about O'Brien. Even after the first year and a half of his uh, popularity in this country, there were a lot of readers who still uh, suspected that Patrick O'Brien was the pseudonym of a more established, well-known author, that no one could write books this good and not be more well-known. What's this, cried Jack? It is a floating island, or rather, a floating archipelago. It is the Galapagos themselves. Oh, no, the lines have come oh, through. Oh, oh, I think every one of his readers would be very interested to know more about him. There is. Um, very little biographical information that comes along with the books. But when you spend that much time with an author, uh, you develop a relationship with that author. And it, it's a very difficult thing because it, it's uh, a relationship that has gone on in the mind and hasn't actually happened. I think people want to know about him because they have come to love the people in his books and they feel that somehow he is the tangible, he is the tangible friend that they could have if only they knew more about him. In short, to Patrick O'Brien. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine that the result of, of having so many avid readers is that many of them become fans. Well, I do discourage that rather, because I, 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 I'm very, I'm a very poor letter writer, and uh, I've asked my agents and the like not to give my address, publishers not to forward. Some get through, but, but I could wish it otherwise. Because it, it, it's embarrassing just... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you one that got through. Okay. Just here. No, I think it must be downstairs. Anyhow, it's long and it's facetious. And it's... Uh, and I think she should... One could say to her, as Dr. Johnson said to somebody, consider, my dear madam, what your praise is worth. Do you follow me? I remember writing to him with a couple of pages of notes on the biography of Sir Joseph Banks. And he wrote back to say, 
Dear Stuart, thank you very much for your most sympathetic comments on my typescript. But all I really want is praise. Period knowledge helped O'Brien to write about 18th century naturalist Joseph Banks. Personal acquaintance informed his biography of Picasso. O'Brien's portrait of the artist was also a portrait of the man and didn't spare the details of Picasso's personal life. Precisely the approach O'Brien won't allow in relation to himself. Uh, his views on biography are not altogether consistent, yes. I suppose I, I'd imagine that he was a rather unlikely candidate to be a biographer. Well, on the other hand, you see, my, my remoteness gives me a certain freedom to, to say, rather, what I choose about a man and to see him with, with, with a fairly cold eye. Picasso was here in Couleur quite often. He, he was terribly spoilt by adulation all round and people writhing on the ground in front of him, you know. It, it's bad for a man like that. He didn't much care for living a solitary life, as, as I know. Patrick has always taken the view that a writer should be known for his works rather than through any other means. And for a long time, he was extremely resistant to meeting the press uh, or any kind of publicity at all. But little by little, it has been possible to persuade him to talk to people. I knew that he was very reluctant to be interviewed and that he had acquiesced under duress because I think he had been uh, advised by his publishers and, uh, and publicists that uh, this would be good for the books and this would help sell books in America. And so he was all, I, I knew that he was not too keen on the idea of letting an outsider into his, his, his life. Mr. O'Brien, is there, is there anything you'd like to remind me of? I, I can't think of anything offhand, but uh, if you become extremely offensive, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Stephen had mentioned his dislike of being questioned. Question and answer is not a civilized form of conversation. It is extremely ill-bred, extremely usual and extremely difficult to turn aside gracefully or without offence. I was definitely there to find out how his own personal history connected to the books. I mean, that's my interest when I write about authors. And it became very clear right from the outset that personal questions were off limits and almost any question could be construed as a personal question. And it was just hit or miss. Mr. O'Brien, I wonder if you could tell me, uh, how long have you had this vineyard? I don't think that that's the right sort of question. It's, it's too personal and direct. I'm sorry. I mean, how much did I pay for it? And that sort of thing. I wouldn't claim, even after spending some hours in conversation with O'Brien, um, that in any sense one has penetrated the many layers of enigma that, yes, he likes to have around himself. At what stage did you set your sights on becoming a writer? I scarcely know, except that I, I wrote for my own amusement when I was sick of bed. I wrote. Oh, rather fanciful things of a, of a person of my own age doing, making surprising voyages and so on. It, it wasn't very good, it was all rather 
over personal and wish fulfillment kind of thing. I did some boyish things that found their way into print and it, it persuaded people that Patrick, if he couldn't get into the Navy and I couldn't get into the Navy, he had better be a writer. I had been warned by a friend of his uh, that that uh, I should I should take everything he tells me about his early life with a grain of salt. That sometimes it didn't add up, or sometimes he contradicted himself. Does it add up? I have no idea. I shared a tutor with a man who had a, a, a very wealthy guardian, and this very wealthy guardian had a three-masted ship square rigged and so we sailed it was mostly west coast of africa he wasn't interested in going to the indies which i rather regretted i remember a few years ago when uh, i was uh, preparing a film on treasure island and uh, we had dinner with o'brien and he was very kind and he we talked to him, asked him about the ships and how he'd learned all this stuff. And it turned out he had never been on a full rigged ship. He said, one of the pleasures of my life, one of the hopes of my life is to sail on a full rigged three master. How much is known about his life? I think as much as he wants us to know, which isn't very much, but he's, he's told us some charming anecdotes about his childhood. But I'm not even entirely clear whether his childhood was spent mostly in Ireland or mostly in England or a mixture of the two. Another who had been gazing at Stephen said, so you are an Englishman? No, sir, said Stephen. I am an Irishman. My relations with Ireland are, are, are very complex. When I was a child, I lived in various parts of the West. I was moved about from cousin to cousin, my mother having died. At one time, I could have been qualified as a native speaker. Alas, that's faded very much. Patrick doesn't welcome inquiries about his childhood, but he has talked to me in casual conversation about his childhood near Ballinasloe. But of his family background, other than they were well-to-do, I can tell you nothing. Now, here's a bench that I call my bench. But it was here that I wrote and finished. Well, I, I finished writing a book, my first proper book, apart from short stories and such. It wasn't a very good book, and I'm glad that I did not publish it under my own name. I shouldn't like to have it looked at now. No, at the, uh, it wasn't very good because uh, I really wasn't very talented, nor did I know much. I was about 22 or thereabouts. I've never heard that he published a book under another name when he was a young man. No, I'm most interested in that. I can't remember whether he'd ever said under a different name, but he. I do believe there was an early book that was lost, according to his account, anyway. Um, the Blitz, something. Um. Identity, said Jack. Is not identity something you're born with? Well, the identity I am thinking of, said Stephen, is something that hovers between a man and the rest of the world a midpoint between his view of himself and theirs of him. There is nothing absolute about this identity of mine. I made inquiries in the Ballinasloe area some years ago. If anyone knew the name O-B-R-I-A-N, nobody did. But then it is many years, it is 60 years, more, since he would have left there. 
and so it's more than possible that he is an O'Brien, but it's more than possible, one would gather, that he's not. It doesn't interest me greatly. I don't care what his name is. Uh, he, he's the, he is the man he is, regardless of his name. I think O'Brien's readers are very inquisitive about his life, but they won't get anywhere. He has written his books, and that is what they should read. And if they read his books carefully, they should see that the kind of, of uh, world that he is describing with approval, the people within that world of whom he approves, are people who have a sense of reticence, uh, which those who poke their noses too much into his own affairs should remember. I'd very much like to do a biography of O'Brien. Um, I'd like to know that man better, because I think he's one of the more interesting men to live in this century. The only thing that posterity has any concern with is what I've written. And things that I've written that I'm not very really pleased with are under the names. 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 As for an end, are endings really so very important? Stern did quite well without one. Often an unfinished picture is all the more interesting for the bare canvas. I remember Bourville's definition of a novel as a work in which life flows in abundance, swirling without a pause, or as you might say, without an end, an organized end. And there is at least one Mozart quartet which stops without the slightest ceremony. Very satisfying when you get used to it. <laughs> 